of all, thank you so much to Lightspeed for inviting me to be able to speak to you all. I think this will hopefully help you move forward in your career or even in the project challenges that you have. And so today I'm going to be talking about building your project leadership avatar. And I really characterize this as a tool for understanding yourself and building a resilient PM leadership skill set for success. And this is agnostic to industry. It's agnostic to even the methodology or framework of project manager project management you're using, but really being able to go and hone in on the things that will help you be successful. And so first, maybe we'll go about defining a little bit more about, you know, what is an avatar? Based off the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and this is a little bit of a condensed version, it's looking at electronic image controlled by a user or an incarnation in human form, an embodiment of something inside of a person or a version of a continuing basic entity. Now, some of these seem very, you know, um, philosophical to say, right? But maybe if we can think about it even just as a video game, that when you go into a video game and you're creating all of these characters, they have different skill sets and whatnot, and you make them to be whatever you want it to be, and then you actually play as them. And this is actually characterized by Todd Herman, the alter ego effect. He has a book out where you create an alter ego or avatar to embody what you want to become. Now, we've seen this in superheroes where we have Spider-Man. He has Peter Parker as his day life. You have Superman and Clark Kent where he's Superman saving the world or he's Clark Kent as a journalist. And there's Batman, of course, where he fights as a vigilante, but by day he's billionaire playboy, right? All of these things where they become something else to reach the goals that they want. And you might be asking yourself, well, what about for real life? How does that work with people? Well, funny enough, we can go through that, but maybe what I'd ask you first is, who's your hero? Who's somebody that you resonate with that you aspire to be or that you really closely align to? This could be family, historical figure. Maybe it's from comic book, anime, sci-fi, whatever it might be. Um, maybe you can throw that into the chat here. And for myself, it's this guy right here behind me, Wolverine. So he's tenacious, ferocious. He's got a bit of an attitude. He's got a healing factor. So if he falls down and, and gets hurt and whatnot, he heals quite quickly. And it's also got a little bit of a temper. But he's also Canadian and from Alberta. So me being from both those areas, uh, it resonates with me. So feel free to throw into the chat here exactly, you know, who's somebody that you might be able to go resonate with. Aaron from Attack on Titan. Yes. Awesome. He can transform. He can go and uh, be able to go and morph from just his regular form into the, one of those huge titans, right? Anyone else? Awesome. Well, I'll keep moving on here. And when we talk about how does this happen for real life? How does this happen with actual people on a day-to-day -day basis? And we've actually seen this in a larger scale, and you probably know these people. The first one is The weekend with Abel Tesfaye. Now, a while back, he said, you know, The weekend was my pop culture name. That was the name I made for music. But this is actually who I am. I am, I am Abel. And that is that is my birth name. That's the name I wanted to go by. But at some point, he decided that the weekend was his avatar or alter ego to be able to become a pop music sensation. And once he had been able to go and merge them, he decided, I'm going to go back to my regular name. Now, a lot of people still know him as the weekend, but maybe somebody that might be more popular, I would argue. And that you may may relate a little bit more to as, you know, knowing her as herself is Sasha Fierce or Beyonce. Sasha Fierce was somebody that Beyonce created to be able to embody all of these, the music, the movements, all of these things that didn't regularly align with where she was growing up, right? She grew up in a Christian home. She had a lot of church upbringing and a lot of those movements and the singing and things like that didn't necessarily seem aligned with where she was at that point in time. And so she created Sasha Fierce to be able to embody what she needed to become 
to become the mega pop star that you see today. And even in sports, we see Black Mamba with Kobe Bryant, right? He created his avatar of being the, the calculated, focused man on the court. But off the court, he didn't want that necessarily confused with how he was running his family life. He wasn't a cold guy behind an off the court, right? But he needed to become something else when he was in that zone of performance on the basketball court. And so what I hope we get out of today is that you have an opportunity to understand yourself, understand some of the dimensions. And I'll be honest here, these dimensions are not limited, right? You can have a, a, an unlimited number of dimensions, but it's understanding which ones are impacting you and which ones you want to focus on. And we'll actually go through a little bit of an exercise of building your avatar. And more importantly, I want you to actually feel something. I want you to be excited. I want you to be curious and creative because through this, what I'm hoping is that you give yourself the opportunity to imagine what you could be. That even though you are where you are right now, you can still work forward to become something more and maybe be a little bit imaginative and venture into areas that you're not as comfortable with or areas that you may know you need development on. And you know what? That's okay. This is that opportunity to embrace that challenge and think of what else is out there. And before I go too far... I'd like to introduce myself. So I'm Ben. I'm a project management leadership coach. I also work as a project management consultant and worked in various different industries on different types of projects as well. I'm the VP of Professional Development for PMI Southern Alberta chapter, and I'm an entrepreneur, I'd say, starting up my coaching business, as well as a podcaster. My podcast is called the Organized Chaos Cafe. Maybe you guys are familiar with organized chaos, and that's something we deal with uh, all the time. But I hope where that podcast goes is to have conversations in many different areas of life to go and bring forward project leadership ideas. And I'm also, I don't know if you can tell, I'm a bit of a comic book nerd. I love comic books. I love the stories. And the thing about comic books and the heroes that the stories are all about is they always have an origin story somewhere that they start. And so for me, my origin story is that I came out with a computer engineering degree. I was working at various different startups. And at the time, the, the bubble, the tech bubble had just recently burst, right? So this is a little bit while back. I don't know if I'm dating myself here. Um, but I worked as a startup, at, at, as a developer at different startups. And honestly, it wasn't really enjoyable for me. And honestly, I'd also want to say I was probably a mediocre developer at best. Finding those semicolons, oof, probably not my, my, my best suit. But where I moved from there was going into management consulting, where I found a bit of a knack in working between both the business and technology side and working on different engagements in, in different capacities. So whether it be a strategic planning session, a financial model, business process improvement, software implementation, digital transformation, all these sort of things I started to go in and work on and, and dive into. And I guess I'm one of the anomalies where I didn't really have a specific niche. I worked as a generalist, if you will, to work across many different industries, whether it be oil and gas, fintech, banking, um, agrochemical, all these areas, as well as different types of projects. But where I found it interesting was that I also found a knack for really putting together project management principles together in delivering these management consulting engagements. Now, nothing against the big four, but you know, when you go into those consulting agencies and, and those large organizations, sometimes the project management on them isn't as strong as maybe you'd like them to go and be. And that's where I found I had a really good understanding with an, from an engineering background to be able to piece together not only the concepts and ideas from a consultative basis, but making sure that they were delivered on time, on budget, and within scope. Now, unfortunately, I've also found myself in a rescuing a lot of projects. Not that I necessarily caused the fire, but I was brought in by people to help rescue these projects. They are stressful, right? So you see these projects, they're in the dumpster fire, and they wanted to bring me in to be able to go and deliver the project. I'd replace the old project manager. And 
one of the things that I've always found difficult is you're not starting from zero, where you're developing Project Charter, you develop the right assumptions, the budget, all of those type of things to be able to reach success. Instead, you're starting from a minus 10. The team is somewhat depleted. The morale is low. You're trying to go and understand and rejig the scope or the schedule and probably the budget as well to be able to see what the success look like for the clients with all of these problems. And you're coming in pretty cold to be able to go and deliver something that's burning hot within the executive's mind. Now, funny enough, I was able to go and spend a lot of my time rescuing these projects with a lot of success. But what I found interesting was that even despite the lack of my technical expertise in these areas, because I've worked as a generalist, I was I was able to be successful. And, and so that really confused me. And what I noticed is that there's a lot of support for the project, but not necessarily for the project manager. And really, it forced me to ask the question of, how do I help project managers go and deliver better? And key questions that I had were, what is the nature of subject matter expertise versus leadership, right? How much do you actually need to know about specific areas versus how do you actually lead your team to success? And then the second piece, again, is just what support is there for project managers to navigate their challenges properly? A lot of times when you go into the PMO and let's say the project manager says, I'm not sure what to do. The PMO is not going to be happy with you, right? They'll say, well, I can see that you're you're over budget and you're behind schedule. And you're kind of like, yes, I know. That's why I need help. And a lot of the times what I've seen, and even just in my experience, is rather than finding someone to help specifically the project manager to work through the ideas and challenges that they have, is that they'll end up replacing them. If you can't do it, I will find someone else who can. And to me, that's a bit disheartening because it's an opportunity to learn and you lose so much time and money to being able to have that transition of knowledge and of people. And even when I looked out into the world, I try and understand, well, what is the what is the gap that we see here? Why is there so much issues with projects running into trouble, right? Some of it is outside of the control of the project manager, but even within the project manager role or their project leadership role, you know, what type of information is there for for us to be able to execute? And what I found was there's a lot of information out there from an organizational perspective. But here's the thing. The organizational side looks at it from a longer time frame. You also have a lot more control. You have direct authority over people of who you have on your team, who you can even let go, right? And you also have the opportunity to define what your culture looks like. But when you go into the project world, it's a really different view, right? You have a shorter time frame. You don't have control for everyone and everything. Even if you have an underperforming resource, it can be very difficult to be able to go and release them. And you also have a cross-matrix multicultural team. And what I mean by that is not necessarily, you know, oh, you're from different areas of the US or different areas of the world. But what I mean is even the cultures between finance, IT, HR, marketing and communications, all of those areas within an organization have their own unique culture, even though you're part of the same organization. And so bridging those cultural situations is something that hasn't necessarily been dived into a lot of the, the leadership literature out there. And where this brought me to is I want to try and address this gap through project leadership coaching. And what I mean by project leadership is this is leadership when people say don't lead your team don't manage your team lead them i i don't i don't believe that <laughs> project leadership to, in my mind is you have your project management principles you have your foundations to be able to do it but you need to layer on the later leadership aspect of it you can't be the visionary to be able to say this is what we want to go and 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 hit but leave everything else on the t- off the table and just be like well my team will handle it, right? I've put I've put the vision together, and now now that I've led you, you guys can go and get it done. No, I believe it's a combination of both of them. And leadership for me, it's it's not about you, but it definitely starts with you. And so there's that tension there of being able to lead and guide and manage the team to be able to go and reach success. And so 
what I want you to be able to understand here is that, you know, there's an understanding of yourself, being able to set your goals, build your action plan and execute and get your feedback so you can continually improve. You know, this is very similar to what they have for Lean Six Sigma with a DIMAC um, model. But I want to say that in the context of yourself as a hero, your hero's journey never ends. So whether you're a veteran project manager or someone new starting into the area, you have an opportunity to grow in many different areas. And even for me, I've always found new things. And that's why I love projects because no project is exactly the same. And there's always something to be learned. And so today we're just going to go first, start with understanding yourself and identifying what is your origin? Now, I'm going to caveat this first. This is not a personality test. How many of you, and I don't know if it's a show of hands or maybe it's just a thumbs up or whatever. How many of you go by you know, the DISC model or, or Myers-Briggs or, or have done those type of exercises before? So all I want to be able to say here is that this is not a personality test to be able to go and say, this is what you are, right? My personal issue with a personality test is you go through these exercises, you go through these questions, and then you say, wow, I'm a, I don't know, let's say INTJ, right? Oh, I'm an introvert. Oh my gosh, I'm an introvert. That means it's going to be very difficult for me to go and do public speaking. Is that true? No. I don't believe so. I think everyone has the opportunity to learn. And so I don't want you to get stuck in this box of classifying yourself as, as I'm an only an analytical person, or I'm only an introvert, or I'm only a person that's that 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 works off of emotion, right? I want you to be able to open up that box and understand the possibilities. And through that, I also hope that you understand that context matters, right? A lot of these things are looking at it from a very broad spectrum of, you know, 20,000 foot view and says, this is your generalization of where you're at. But instead, I want you to go and think about the context of how you're looking at yourself. Do you behave consistently in every situation, regardless of the audience? I'll be pretty sure that I don't teach my kids the same way that I'm talking to executive sponsors of a project, right? Who wants that status report? I don't know. <laughs> the, the president probably like, wants it, but he probably doesn't want it in that way, right? So your behavior in terms of the situation that you're in, the audience that you're interacting with, all of that has an impact of how you behave and the outcomes that you're going to go and seek. And so if you'd like to, I'd invite you to open up the work, the a worksheet that I've provided here. Here's a QR code. I'll give I'll leave this up for a little bit where you can go ahead and open up a PDF that allows you to follow along with it. You don't have to work off the worksheet if you don't want to, and you can just go ahead and listen. But I find that the PDF will give you an idea of how all of these things come together. So I'll leave that up for a little bit and um while we do that is maybe just having an understanding from yourself. Uh, okay, so someone's not able to see the link. I'm gonna try and post the link in here. Hold on a second. All right, sorry for not having that absolutely prepared. Um, so that the link I've just put into the chat there, um, Mar Marwain, um, let me know if you can access that. And we should be good. All right, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to go and pop it into the chat and um, I'll try and address it or someone from the Light Lightspeed team can definitely help out there as well. All right. So what I'm going to walk you through are the four different areas of building your avatar. And again, when I said context matters, we're going to start first with the situation. What is the view that you want to look through in determining what situation you're in? And so you could be looking at it from various lenses. You could be looking at it from a life perspective. You could be looking at it from your career. Maybe it's for the specific project you're on. 
Or if you want to get really granular is what is the challenge you're running through you're you're running into inside of that project, right? So go ahead and select one because that's going to be your frame of focus inside of the rest of this assessment, right? So next, we're going to look at the people, the people involved, the audience, the people that you're interacting with. So I've kind of boiled this down into three areas, and they're really leveraging on two different elements. One is frequency. How often are you interacting with them? And the second one is power levels, right? Different superheroes all have different powers, but not all of them are equal. If you put Thor against Hawkeye, I'm pretty sure I'm going to put my money on Thor. He's got a lot more power than Hawkeye, even though they're both heroes, right? And so from a project team perspective, these are people that you're interacting with on a more frequent basis, and you have a little bit more power over them, still indirect authority, but still authority nonetheless. And this is the team that you're leading. So you could be interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis, if not even hour to hour, right? The next is then the executives and sponsors. So these are people that are at an elevated position from you inside of the project. They could be VPs, C-suite people, right? But there are people that also have high influence that you may not be interacting as much, but therefore the communication with them is very much more important, right? And then you have peer st stakeholders. So these are people that are maybe on the side of your project. You don't interact with them as much, but they still have influence, but not as much as, say, an executive sponsor. So within these group of people, maybe select the, the group that you want to be focusing in on. So again, when you look at your situation, now you've said maybe you've selected your the current project you're working on. And the people you're engaging with and working with um, I don't know, maybe it's your sponsors. Let's focus on that for a second, right? And typically within my coaching, we actually look at the combination of all of them, but for simplicity's sake, just choose one of them. And now this one is a little bit more broad and it dives a little bit deeper into yourself and we don't necessarily need to do go through it all today, but it's definitely something I want you to go and understand and maybe take away and see what you think about it. And from a motivation perspective is understanding what drives you, what drives you within this project to be able to get it done, right? Within that, you also have your core values of what do you stand for? what, Why do you do what you do? And what drives you as a whole or what drives you within a certain situation? What is your motivation, right? At the same time, you can also note down, you know, any superhero has their special abilities. So what are your special abilities? What makes you stand out? whether it be your technical skills or your relational skills, your power skills, right? What are all the things that make you special? And here's the interesting thing I want you also to think about is that when you define what your core values are, you'll also inherently also stand what doesn't, what you don't stand for, and the things that, that might trigger you. So if we look at it from an emotional intelligence perspective, right, you'll have a better understanding of how does, what are the things that are going to get me a little bit more hot under the collar for? And an example would be, say for me, that being on time, being punctual is a core value for me, right? For someone that comes late to a meeting, who shows up late for lunch, even if they're by five minutes, it drives you nuts. You look at the time, it's you're supposed to meet at 12, it's now 12.01, and now you're starting to go and feel a little bit of that emotion underneath it, right? And maybe, you know, contrary to that is that if someone doesn't have a huge value on that, they're probably okay with somebody arriving late. They're like, ah, that's okay. I'm I'm good with that because it's, it's not something that I, I hold as a high priority, even maybe something of, say, quality of work, or maybe it's speed of work, right? Those things will, will help you also identify your emotional triggers within yourself. So this exercise is useful not just for what you want to do, but also how to handle the things that you don't like happening. And the last one here is around the actions. This is where all of the meat is. And as you go through these next few exercises here, I'm going to just make sure that 
you don't get trapped in illusory superiority. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's just basically thinking maybe you're better than you than you are, right? And it's a natural bias that we all have. But maybe, and I'm not sure if we're able to go and do that here, but if you can give a thumbs up if you think you are a better project manager than your peers on this call, go ahead and give a thumbs up. So either maybe everyone everyone will have no thumbs up. I don't know. <laughs> but basically it's saying, you know, I just want you to, as we go through this, is be honest with yourself, be able to understand where you're at. Because when we go through the different elements here, I want you to think about moving up the scale of, of understanding where you need work, right? So this is just a simple learning pyramid that I think a lot of you have seen, but we want to make sure we start from the perspective of conscious incompetence. So there's things we know we need to go and work on and we know we need to go and improve on. And from an action perspective, let's maybe start with, you know, again, what is your self-awareness? Where do you think you are on that scale of being self-aware to be able to kickstart your journey, right? And as we go through this is then saying, well, what is our challenge response? And what do I mean that is what's your response to challenges in the first minute upon realizing that something has gone wrong? How do you feel internally? Does it, is it emotions? Is it immediate action? Do you need time to go and collect yourself? How are you, are, are you really, you know, fiery and, and you'll be, I don't know, very, very temperamental when something comes about? How do you how do you rate yourself in terms of how you respond to challenges as they come to you? The next is looking at what is your risk appetite? You know, what is what drives your perception of safe and what risks are you willing to go and take within project within projects, within maybe the schedule or the budget? And I'd say for me and probably a lot of project managers on there. I am I am risk averse. I am very, you know, let's keep everything tight. Don't spend any more than you need to. Let's not go out taking too many chances on maybe trying to capitalize on an opportunity if I know that a path is already set for you, right? This just helps to, to be able to understand exactly um, how you might work in different situations, right? If there's something that's brought up of an opportunity, are you willing to go and take it? Next here is your propensity for action. Now, this is an interesting run, right? I view this as part of the area where you have the, I'll say the balance of paradoxes. How much planning do you do before you take action? And how much action should you take before planning? Between both agile and waterfall methods, this is something of a tension that you always, you're always trying to go and balance, right? And, you know, for those that will say are, I don't know, anti-agile, they would say, you know, what do you call doing a project without a plan? Agile, <laughs> right? And obviously that's not true. There is a certain amount of planning that does go on within the agile world, right? And But it's allowing to go and have different ownership of, of different tasks and activities, but it's understanding how, how much do you think you need to go and have for you to be comfortable taking action? Decision making is the next one where you're, how do you go and make decisions for yourself? Do you balance that between your gut decision or do you need a lot of data and how much data is necessary? Or is it a balance between both? And even when you look at decision making with a group, it's then saying, how collaborative are you in that? Are you directing it? within that certain situation with those people and providing recommendations and say, look, this is the way we're going to go? Or do you actually work through a lot of the information and the decisions? Or do you actually delegate it out to the group to be able to make those decisions? You know, How does that work for you? And in the end, within the context of your situation and of your audience, how confident are you? So next, we'll take a look at the technical. I'm going to skim over this a little bit because being in this group of project managers, I think a lot of you already have a lot of great skill here to be able to go through it. And even now, I think the technical list of things that go on, it's just going to keep on growing, right? 
AI now is now something that people are saying, well, do I have the technical skill to be able to use AI? Not that you need to develop it, but am I am I leveraging it properly inside of my project? And even to an extent, maybe that even replaces some of our existing skills. So when we look at estimation, that's kind of an interesting one, right? Because estimation is usually the the best ones are built off of a lot of data. If you're working with an organization, sometimes you don't have a lot of that historical data to be able to say, well, I think this activity should take three weeks or one week or maybe five months, right? But now with the aggregate data that you can grab out of AI, they may be able to go and provide you what are industry standards for a task like this, right? That's something you haven't been able to leverage before. So all of these things around scheduling, risk and issue management, cost management, multitasking is an interesting one, right? I consider that technical because maybe you're managing multiple projects. You need to understand how your brain is contextually switching between many different things. Quality management, right? So all of these areas are, we'll say are technical, but they can continue to grow and you can continue to go and enhance them. Or even if there's areas that you need more help with. I'll say for me, accounting and financial cost control pieces are not my favorite. So cost management for me, it feels like when you throw accounting rules on top of it, I'm like, all right, you do your Harry Potter magic on it. And I'll just tell you, this is how much we've spent. Um, I don't know how it fits into your IFRS, but I need help to be able to work through some of the details of that, right? And communication. This is where it's key, obviously, for a lot of project managers. And where, you know, even from PMI's Pulse of the Profession from 2017, 37% is of direct project failure is from failures of communication. And there's probably even more that are from indirect failures. So what I'd ask you through here is understand what are the channels that you might have to do your communication with, right? What do you prefer? Do you like PowerPoint? in-person meetings, maybe it's virtual calls, meetings, right? And maybe you like to do it through screen sharing. This is an opportunity for you to go and say, where do I really excel at being able to go and communicate with different team members, with different stakeholders, or basically your audience that we identified before, how do you like communicating with them, right? Next is structure. And that's looking a little bit more of how are you structuring your information? right? Does your head go towards being able to have it in categories or maybe it's chronological, whatever it might be, right? Where does your head go in terms of putting that information from your brain onto, we'll say, digital paper? And when we look at style, it's saying, what? How, how do you like to go and present that information? Do you like to tell a story? Do you like to be transparent and tell people a lot of different things as much as you can about everything? Or do you only provide enough information that they understand enough, right? And sometimes there's a balance between them. And even in my past experience, I find developers, technical people, they really like transparency. Even if it doesn't relate to them, it's like, tell me everything about anything. I want to know the guts of how all this comes together. But with executives, they just want to the point, I want it be, to be very clear. And even with other peer stakeholders of the project, sometimes I'll, I'll need to make a decision as to, I only need them to provide them with what they need to know. I don't need to provide them everything because then it creates actually more noise and problems for me. So maybe you can take a look and say, what is your style? What do you like to do? within, again, your situation and your audience. Problem solving. So how do you like to go and solve your problems? And I'd say, let's look at it from aside from the people side of it. This is looking at it from, let's say, a technical problem, right? If there's a programming uh, bug that came in, or maybe something doesn't just doesn't work, right? It has to do with things, but not necessarily with people. How do you work to go and solve that problem? Are you collaborative? Or do you like to go and direct it? And some of the interesting things that I've found in my discussions and research with other subject matter experts who are also project managers is sometimes they get caught into dictating what the solution is. I've done this multiple times, so this is how we should go and solve it, right? And they direct the team to solve it in that way. But for me, as a generalist, I honestly don't have that subject matter expertise to dictate it with. So a lot of the time, 
I will be a lot more collaborative with the group to be able to say, look, I need your guys' help to be able to do it. We need to, let's come up with what various different solutions and evaluate what they are. The downside with that is sometimes it does take a little bit longer, right? But maybe more creative ideas come up. I don't know. So there are different trade-offs that happen inside of problem solving. Conflict resolution. Oof, that's something that everyone loves to do, right? Hey, can I have a chat? Or maybe just someone just doesn't even talk to you, right? They just avoid you. How do you resolve conflict? And I think this is more looking at it from the perspective of people. These are people issues. Maybe someone's underperforming. Maybe two people aren't getting along, right? One person feels like it's too hard. Another person feels like, ah, they're, they're being so soft with all these things. They're not keeping people accountable. How do you resolve those team conflicts, right? What's, what, what do you feel like is your approach to doing that? And relationships, for me, this is looking at how do I relate to different uh, groups and teams and how do I like to build these relationships? The funny thing for me, I usually end up as friends with project teams, right? We'll go and hang out and be like, hey, afterwards, you want to go grab a drink? Even on the weekend, it might be like, hey, I'm doing something. You guys want to do something? Maybe, right? Maybe you build up a relationship to that end. But very rarely do I ever have that relationship with an executive stakeholder. Um, Part of it might be my own personality. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I should be asking them out for golf. (laughs) I don't know. But how do you build your relationships inside of your context? And how do you you want to go in and work with them, right? And next is then looking at motivation. How do you motivate your team? How do you communicate that motivation to them? Do you self-drive them and just say, all right, we got to get this done. I'll leave it up to you. Or even, you know, or are you doing those Friday night lights types of of inspirational speeches all the time in your team stand-ups, right? Where you're rallying the troops, right? Like they're going into war. I don't know. But Many of those, maybe you have to have a different format in how you like to go and carry it out within your situation. And with facilitation, you can also look at it from a meeting perspective. When you're in your meetings, how are you behaving with, again, that situation and that audience? Are you facilitating the meeting? Are you driving the meeting? What is what is your preferred role inside of those type of areas? And this... This one here is I love because I love asking questions. I love being able to dive into the questions. So I always say, you know, what is what is your ability to ask these insightful questions, to, to, to d- dive a little bit deeper and get the answers that you want, right? And the last one here that some people might be afraid of is public speaking, right? How do you rate yourself in able to go and speak to large audiences or people that are in higher levels than you. This could be something very difficult. And it, I'll, I'll say even for myself, it was difficult. I remember standing in front of an audience for a, uh, a, a trade show convention and they said, you know, you're doing just the quick lunch introduction. And I just completely bombed it. Reading off a, a sheet, I was stuttering, my hands were shaking. I was like embarrassed to be up there, right? But even when you show up in your meetings, that's a form of public speaking. And for me, I actually went and got a public speaking coach so that I could be able to express my ideas more confidently, be able to go and speak to them and be able to go and build those ideas and recommendations and be able to influence the people that I talk to, right? And that to me is the power of public speaking where you may not value it as much as perhaps a technical project manager, but you may be able to go and see the advancements it can it can make within your career. And so now we can talk about building your avatar. So on the one side, we had the O column, and maybe I, I may have forgot to mention this earlier, is when you fill that out for the O column, that's for your origin. That's where you're starting from. And the next piece is under understanding who do you want to be? Now, here's the thing. We've gone through the exercise of saying, where am I at now? What do I prefer? What do I like, right? But instead, from an avatar perspective is, let's start looking at what does it look like from a future focus perspective? What do I need to grow in the ways for the context you need to become 
the new version of you. So let's say, for example, even the channels of communication. I love doing PowerPoint, but if my executive freaking hates PowerPoint, I may need to go and transform myself into someone that can, that just needs to speak to notes or maybe needs to be more effective with a simple email communication, right? And so when we go through all of these elements again, is then asking yourself, what do I need to become successful in the situation I'm in? What would provide the best results and how do I measure that progress, right? How do I know that I'm communicating more effectively? And so now if you take a look at what your answers were of your origin story, you can then now say in the A column of saying, what do I want to be or what do I need to be in order to be successful? And here's the thing, what you need to be may not be where you are right now. I may need to go and learn more and get coached and practice more public speaking. I may need to go and learn more about how to use AI to do better project estimation. Or maybe I need to learn how to go and facilitate the meetings better, right? To go and reach better outcomes. So on the A column, and we'll quickly go through this, but we don't have to do it necessarily now because this is a little bit more of a thoughtful experiment that you can take away, is you go through all of these elements and say, well, maybe I need to build a little bit more self-awareness. You know, there's the interesting um, quote, and I'm not going to use the explicatives in here, but basically, if everyone else is the problem, maybe I'm the problem. So, so how self-aware are you of yourself in the situation that you're in. Maybe within the challenge response, I need to be a little bit more passionate in it. Maybe in front of executives, I need to be a little bit more stoic. But in front of my team, I need to show that I care. Maybe I need to go and take more risk inside of my project to be able to move it forward because the safe route will just take way too long. And have you calculated that risk properly, right? Do I need to maybe then, even though if I'm going to take more risk, it means I need to do more planning. And so my propensity for action means that I can't go and act more rashly now because I'm taking a larger risk, right? And how does that impact your confidence? So even when we look at the technical side is then saying, maybe I need to go work a little bit more on, on my multitasking and actually reduce it. I need to go and focus on things more because there's little mistakes that I'm making and I need to go and pull some of these things back, right? And again, the communication ones are, are key in terms of saying, I need to go and actually with the executives, I need to do a little bit more storytelling with them. And I need to go and be able to go and have more structure to how I'm putting that information together and ensure that I'm asking better questions. Maybe I need to drive the meeting a little bit more because maybe my CEO is the CEO of a startup. He's got propeller head syndrome. And what I mean by that is, you know, they got these little, you know, those hats with the little propeller on the top. They just keep spinning them and then the hat flies off. Then they put the next hat on, they spin that one and that, that hat flies off, right? They got so many different ideas that you can't facilitate the conversation with them because it's all over the place and you need to be get them focused and drive the conversation, Right. How do you need to go and work with these different people, again, in that different situation that you're in? And so I'd say this is then your chance to make it unique to you. You can name your avatar. Name it whatever you want it to be that reflects who you want to be. And, you know, whether I call myself the, the I don't know, the project management Canuck, right? Maybe that's going to be my avatar name that helps me align and think about that when I go into that situation, my first thought is I need to be more like that avatar so that I can become successful. And so as you go through this, this is really about taking your next steps in your evolution and understanding what do you need to question, learn, practice, and do so that you can actually become your avatar. Just saying that you want to be a public speaker is not enough, right? You can say, I want, I'm, I'm very nervous and shy and not very confident at public speaking, but I need to get to that stage where I am, where I can speak on the spot about anything, right? Just thinking about that endpoint doesn't get you far enough. Instead, you need to go and then say, what do I need to go and plan and act and do 
in order to get to that point where I have reached my goal. And so I hope for you guys, you can take away that you've set your origin, you've built out a little bit of what your avatar looks at and start thinking about examining what are the possible next steps going to get you there. We've done a little bit of the first two of understanding yourself and set your goals. And as you do that, you can then start to think about what is your action plan? How do you execute it? And how do you get feedback? How do you know that you're doing well and that you're progressing towards your goals? And so I'd ask you, and you can feel free to type into the chat is, you know, what did you discover? What did you find out about yourself in going through this exercise and talking about it? Again, this isn't definitive to say it's only about these things. There may be other elements that you want to go and add into it and say, I want to work on these as well, right? And also, how do you feel about it? Do you feel engaged? Does, does that have that feeling of excitement and curiosity that I wanted to go and elicit in you earlier? And the reason why I ask this is because you're going to remember a little bit more if you can tie it back to an emotional feeling that you have. So I hope that you've had some feeling inside of this presentation that you, you can be imaginative and curious. Now, I know some of you might be looking and saying, well, how do I get there? Who, who can help me? right? The problem is with all of these things is that I've found there's been very little support for project managers to navigate these things, right? People have said PMOs, they need to have training and support. And yet when you go to them, it may not feel safe, right? You saying, I need to work on these things and I don't know how to be able to go and do it. They, they may say, well, I'm going to find someone else that, that can. But I want you to know that there is a community out there. You are not alone whether it's on LinkedIn or working with myself or finding other coaches to be able to want to help you, you are not alone. The barriers to development, sometimes you're thinking about, well, where do I start? Where do I begin? How do I get this knowledge? How do I practice it and build that experience so that I can become that avatar? How do I get the right feedback again? And how do I keep myself accountable? How many of you have made you know, New Year's resolutions saying, I want to go and lose weight? And after, you know, it's like, I got to make sure I go to the gym every week. And then after the first month, you just start falling off of it because, you know, no one's really keeping you accountable to it, right? Being able to find that partner accountability is very, is very key to moving you forward. And one of the things I do want to say is that, you know, today's best CEOs all get their own executive coach. They have someone that helps them work through their ideas and works with them to be able to reach that level of performance that they're seeking. And in my opinion, I'd say you are the CEO of your project. You are the CEO. And if that's the case, then why shouldn't the CEO of a project also get their own coach to be able to help them excel and perform? So again, thank you so much to Lightspeed for having me on today. Um, Here's my QR code to be able to connect with me. I'd really love to go and engage with you, maybe understand what your challenges are. For me, I work with individuals as a project management leadership coach, as well as organizations to with their PMOs to help deliver workshops and coaching alongside with that to make sure that their organizations can help integrate what they learn and not just go to a session and say, okay, now that you've sat into it for a few hours, I hope you've learned it. It's no, let's actually see how that integrates into your day-to-day -day work and see how you improve your performance delivery and hopefully reduce your stress and anxiousness around it as well. So again, thank you so much to the Lightspeed team for having me on today. <laughs>